Two. Hi, you guys, Ginger Cook here, and this is story time acrylic painting. This is where today I will be telling you some ramblings, just miscellaneous stories of, of things that have happened that are sort of interesting and maybe fun, or at least I think hope they are. And I will be painting a enchanted garden and a white old Adirondack chair. Um, which I hope you guys love seeing. Now, this is not a tutorial. I've said this before. These are commissioned paintings that have been pre-sold and pre-bought, and I have a lot of them to do. And when, I, when we put out the offer to our uh, academy students, those who are taking our online lessons from me, uh, the red and purple members who get personal art coaching, uh, they could either pay by the month or they can pay annually. Now, anyone that signs up as an annual member saves two months free. It's like you get two months free, which is a big deal, and you know, which is really great. But when you um, to in encourage um, more membership signups, we made the uh, offer in uh, um, last November, about mid-November is when we came up with that, and clear to December, if any of our members uh, renew their membership before the end of the year, they would get an original painting. And um, uh, we had a lot more people take us up on it than I thought they would, thus I have a lot of paintings to do. And therefore, you get to hang out with me while I paint them because these were not, and we told them these would never be tutorials. I may, for instance, occasionally do uh, something similar as a tutorial in our academy, but uh, these are all original one-of-a-kind pieces, and that's what we promise people. And so, but you get to see them made. So again, these are not, um, uh, not, not tutorials, but sometimes you can learn a lot just by watching the process. And so that's what I'll be doing today as I, tell you, as I start rambling. I'm on an 8 by 10 canvas. You can see I've lightly sketched an Adirondack chair and a couple of posts for my... Um, and the, the background, someone says, how do you choose the background? This is one we happen to have. Could have done brown, could have done green, didn't really matter. Just pick something and went with it. So, because that question has come up. Um, Comes up quite often. And quite often. Now, I want to answer a couple of questions that come from in the comments from the story time before. We've been doing this for a few weeks now. And so there have been some questions that have come up from others who have um, been watching uh, story time. And one of the questions was, have you ever done any genealogy? Um, and my daughter, Cinnamon, uh, did some a few years ago. She, you know, got onto that site and did some. And um, uh, she found, uh, which was interesting, she found out that I had a half-sister from my original parents who died. When, when, when both of them were dead before I uh, was a year old. That, um, that there had been um, a maid in the house, uh, a Japanese maid, and apparently my father uh, had an affair with her. There were a lot, we had a lot of maids. It was quite a, you know, in his mansion. And um, uh, the, um, um, apparently there was a child, and my mother uh, knew about her because there were articles or where she, she um, uh, she, apparently, we looked. We looked her up. She never had any children. Um, this, I think, she was probably not even alive by the time we discovered that, that she existed. But um, uh, anyway, um, her name was Jane, I think, named Nakamura. I think was her name. Which you know, those things are always interesting because my brother, my brothers didn't know a thing about her because she would have been my oldest brother, Dennis, was not born, and, you know, probably she was, um, oh gosh, she must have been, um, you know, in high school when he was, when she, when, uh, when she was born. But anyway, that's to answer your question. Cinnamon did a lot of genealogy on that point. We have not done a DNA test for the Albert Einstein thing, but that's another story to see if I was related to Albert Einstein. So, um, and you're going, what? But again, that's an, that's another story for another time. So, Ooh, a little tease. I, I was uh, fortunate enough uh, when Cinnamon was growing up, we, she was born in Aspen, Colorado, and we had a condo there, and I got into horses 
And uh, her dad had gotten into hang gliding in Aspen when nobody was doing it. Uh, he was definitely he was into hang gliding. And kind of, you know, well, that's nice you're doing. What are you doing for me? I want a horse. And so uh, we had rented our condominium out um, so we could go to Cal and rented it out so uh, to tourists because we lived in a tourist thing so we could go to California in the winter so he could hang glide. All right. So uh, uh, the deal I made with him was, uh, you know, I could get a horse. And he said, and I think I had $700 to buy a horse and tack and equipment and everything with, which was a lot of money even back then. And uh, we would pay for the boarding of the horse because the place that we found to keep the horse was like about a 20 minute drive out of Aspen, this ranch. So I ended up buying uh, my horse. And I made the, the story of my horse is a whole other um, a whole other adventure, so we're not—we're going to leave it there. But just so you know, um, uh, in order, you know, once once um, Colby decided that he didn't want to live in Aspen anymore, and he wanted to live in California where he could fly his hand gliders, uh, we decided to move. Now, the other reason we decided to move was uh, we lived in this. <coughs> well, it was originally a three-bedroom condo, but we knocked a wall out downstairs um, after uh, Cinnamon was born, and th that was our living room and dining room. It was very small, and we had a basement for art and projects, and then um, uh, uh, then, the, then, then there was two units in the front. It's eight, 800 East Hyman is where we lived in Aspen, 800 uh, Chatelet condominiums, okay? I know sometimes people get wonder where she lived, wonder what that was like. Well, that's what that was like. So um, anyhow, the upshot of it was is that um, uh, we, we got, Colby got into a fight with, there was this lady, that, she was the mother of one of the other people in the building, John Chapman, and she took, she loved Cinnamon, but she took a dislike to Colby. I mean, big time dislike. And she had a camera. This was before Instagram, or we would have all been in trouble. And she, anyway, she harassed him and caused a lot of problems and made living there uncomfortable. And um, in fact, when we left, we moved out, she said, see, I drove him out. Well, he didn't, she didn't really, we would have, he would have gone after her probably in some other way, got rid of her, but you know, he decided to go to California. So we were looking for property. We ended up buying a, uh, four acres, almost four acres, not quite, uh, house in, uh, in, in uh, well, not a house, it was just the land. We just got this property. And which was kind of, you know, it was lovely. It was a beautiful piece of property. And, and we built a house on it. So there, that's a kind of the genesis of um, maybe some of this, okay? And so we're, we're living in Southern California. So these are just some, so we've got this property on Lone Jack Road. And, uh, uh, and I can't even remember the address, but um, so we had kind of a dirt drive going up to the road. So these are some, and I've told you some stories about, I said one of the stories I've I told in, this, in story time was the story of how um, uh, it, you know, we, uh, you know, I almost, you know, we stole all that water from the city, you know, you know, diverting a pipe. That's a real fun story. If you haven't heard that one, but it'll give you a little context of our life on Lone Jack Road. But this garden reminds me of the fact that there was a time in my life when I really wanted to get into gardening. And, um, uh, don't know what dropped there, John, but I'm on it, boss. Oh, it's the my it's my it's I might I might need that, so I won't take it far. Okay. Yeah, there's my but, so anyway, we we're um 
And I was I wanted to get into gardening. And so um, I know the first thing about gardening. I mean, the only time I the also had in Aspen, and when we lived in Aspen, um, the, there was a grass yard that the condominiums all shared, kind of a common area. And we had our, um, our walk, but the, really the only thing I had was some flower boxes on a fence as far as any kind of gardening stuff. Going. And I remember one time um, it snowed on my geraniums. I'd planted them in July and killed them. And my, one of my friends said, don't plant them, it's too early. I'm going, it's July, you know? <laughs> it's just, I want some flowers anyway. So I, I wasn't really, I don't know first thing about gardening. Um, Growing up, my mother did some gardening when I was very small, when I went to live with her when I was five, my adopted mother. But everything else on that landscape, when we lived on Triple Creek Ranch, all the landscaping was um, uh, natural. There wasn't any um, flowers or anything like that. In fact, uh, mother had gone to eastern Washington, which is uh, Yakima, and had picked a bunch of sagebrush, can you imagine? And we had sagebrush and barrels kind of like part of the landscape and barrels going up to the house on the walk. I mean, that's how over she was with flowers and stuff. She wasn't doing any of that. So anyway, we're in California and I really wanted to do um, some flowery stuff. I really wanted to do that. So I, I got into gardening and the the thing about it was is that uh, in California, if you really uh, <clears throat> if you weren't into gardening originally, it's hard not to be because anything will grow. The climate is just Southern California, San Diego is just perfect for um, absolutely perfect for for planting things. If you plant it, pretty much it's pretty hard to kill it. I mean. One time we had some ch uh, some cherry tomato bushes growing on the side of our driveway just from a seed that a bird had dropped. Big cherry, ter turned into a beautiful big um, cherry tomato bush. So, um, yeah, you could, so anyway, uh, when we came up, to, we had sort of this house pad, this very flat house pad. Um, I think I'll take my chalk and draw you a picture because it's, you know, sometimes some things are just a little hard to describe, right? So that's almost okay what's there. So chalk here, where's some chalk? Chalk, come here, chalk, chalk. It's gotta be one of you, chalk. Oh, here, here. So you had this long driveway coming up a hill, big long hill, and then at the top of the hill, we had this area kind of this shape. Then the driveway went curved around and then did this and then out to Lone Jack, okay? This is a pretty steep hill. And then, so the house was a kind of a, was kind of shape, was shaped like this, okay? On this part of the, the hill, probably about this, this much of it like this. So I wanted to plant, and then we had all along here, this was cliff going down this way, and then this was not so steep, and we had, we planted fruit trees and stuff. Our pond was way down here, over here, another one up here, and then all this was our property. So right in this area, um, I wanted, uh, you know, had, wanted to break this up, so I had some sort of a garden like this, and I had some garden along here, and I had a tree, and. So this little area in here is what I was trying to um, do. And if you want to see it from the side view, the house was shaped like this. Then there was a middle section, and then there was a, another tall section like this. These were big, you know, tall, tall windows and um, like that. And then you came in the door, and uh, there's some round windows, big round windows. All right, so that was that. That was that. So we're talking about this area right in front of here that I wanted to plant something with. Okay, and I had a little bit of planting along this side here and around here, but I had this sort of almost like island area with rocks that I was planting. So if that makes sense. So anyhow, um, 
I, I wanted, I, I had, we lived in the country, so the, the land around us was, um, it, it didn't have house on it, it was just natural sagebrush or whatever it was, right? And my, uh, let's see, I've got to put some paper towel out here and do all that. And you may have heard us talk about tractors. Uh, the neighbors had one of those Kubota tractors, the really good Japanese tractors. And we had something from Montgomery Wards that was um, kind of a tractor, lawnmower kind of thing. And that's what we had. It wasn't, I mean, it was little cinnamon could, could drive it. Okay. And. I had spied down by, there was a river that ran, not on our property, but to the left of our property, there was a river that ran. And it kind of wound it around in front of another, you know, down below this property before it got to the road. Um, there was some area that was more swampy or whatever. And uh, there was this beautiful old dead um, tree, big oak tree thing that was, um, had died. And the, uh, the and I thought, you know, if I could just get this up into the house, I could do a planter around. I could have this tree, and I could put that as the focal part of my garden. This this old log, okay, old rusty kind of log, kind of kind of about the size. If anybody ever watched the saw my video um, of um, the Whitling Boy, which was. Um, one of the old EG paintings on our website, uh, the kids sitting on a log. It was a log very much like that and full of character and very unusual for Southern California. The, those logs, I mean, you just couldn't go to the store and buy one. That was, that was, that was something. That was a really an amazing log. So I told Col Colby, Cinnamon's dad, I said, I needed to have that log uh, Absolutely had to have that long. No question about it. Had to have it. And um, and he says, well, how, how are we going to get it there? And I says, well, we can put chains around it and we can drag it with the tractor. Well, our tractor was the size of, you know, like a go-kart. It was a little, like, like this chair, only maybe with a back end, right? It was not that tall. It was like this, you know? And it didn't have much horsepower. I don't understand, you know, I don't understand horse charge. I just wanted that um, stupid log. I really wanted that log a lot. And the, so first off, we had to, the guy that we had, we had to ask permission to steal, to take the log because it wasn't on our property. So the guy that we, the guy that, um, the guy didn't want to give us the log for the longest time. I don't remember if we had to buy it for him or what, but I, we couldn't just be seen taking the log without permission. We finally figured out who owned the log, and I mean, he wasn't. The property wasn't developed. Nobody. Why would anybody care if we had this stupid log? So, um, anyhow, <coughs> we got permission for the log. <coughs> we got some chain, and we got it hooked up to the tractor, and we could. We could move, maybe move it. Two car lengths, if that, before the tractor gave up and couldn't go anymore. It was, it was hurt, you know. And then we had to stop. So I realized it was going to take us about 10 days to get that log from where it was up to the house. But I was all keen on it, right? And guess who wasn't keen on it? <laughs> Colby. <laughs> Colby was not the least bit keen on this wonderful log. He didn't seem, he didn't have my vision of this log, right? I mean, I, I'm telling you what, um, I had done, I'd gone to great lengths to find, the, you know, I had all planned out the flowers we were going to plant around. I had some rocks. You could get rocks in those days in California. We had lots of rocks that I could put in the garden. So we only just needed, we just needed this log. So every day we went out there for a while and we did, we moved the log till the tractor was kind of burning up and then we had to stop. Okay, according to Colby, you couldn't do it anymore. And it took forever. And the only person that was really enthusiastic about this log was me. 
And, every, you know, I was just really planting my whole garden around this log thing, right? And so, uh, anyway, the upshot of it was is that we got almost to, the, I mean, we had a steep driveway. Our driveway was so steep that we, we had ordered, um, um, you know, bottled water from the sparkless truck that came up, the, would come up the driveway. And um, the, the uh, one time, this, it was so steep, the sparklets truck almost tipped over, okay? So if you thought it was hard pulling that log on, in all fairness to Colby, pulling the log on flat ground, uh, pulling it on um, up a hill it was really a strain on the tractor. But you know, I wasn't hearing any of that, right? I wanted the log. Don't be a wuss, I want the log. Let's get the log up here. And we were almost to the very top of the, the, the flat area where we were gonna put it. And the log broke in two. Oh. I After was all that? so upset. And I was mad, I was upset and I was just furious. I was, Colby hadn't seen me that mad at him for a long time. I mean, I was just so mad at him, I could have spit nails, and he didn't understand why I was so upset. Well, he said, I know you wanted the log, but I don't understand why you're so mad. And again, I could barely talk about it. I was so mad. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I was that so mad, I could barely talk to him about why I was mad. And this, you know, there was a big, you know, big fight entailed and, you know, screaming and yelling, and which he thought was excessive, okay? Because all things considered, right? And um, he says, I don't understand why you're so mad about me. It's not my fault that that dumb log broke. And I'm going, I says, it is your fault. And he says, how do you figure? I said, well, because the way oh, you're very smart. And if you'd wanted that log in one piece, it never would have broken. You would have figured something out. You would have made a plan, and the log never would have broken. You know, and that was really what I was thinking about it. He just couldn't believe that I would, you know, even entertain such, you know, a thought that somehow that he had done this on purpose. But I really did feel that way. I really did feel like if he had wanted the log, you know what? We would have had the log, because he was that kind of a genius. And I know a lot of people say that about the people they're married to, but. The one thing I say about Cinnamon's dad was he had an extremely high IQ, and he did extraordinary things. And um, just to give you an example, um, uh, toward the you know he was not a reader of fictional books, and I was a reader of uh, you know I read all the time. That was my one vice. I read all the time. Uh, if I if I for years. If I went to the bookstore, if I didn't have at least five unread books sitting in the house, it was like somebody that was out of cigarettes if they're down a carton. That's how addictive books were to me. So anyway, but he didn't read. He read journal, journals and stuff, but he's just never read. Uh, <clears throat> he never read stuff like, um, if it wasn't a ma ma magazine or, um, um, you know, like, if you weren't learning something from it, in other words, like a mechanical magazine or something else, like um, like when I was in the grocery store shopping, sometimes he would just um, wait by the um, by the magazine section and just peruse magazines. Okay. Um, in fact, here's an example of that. So we had. We went to a, a, a beach um, in California and uh, uh, did a lot of beach roaming. And we had a friend, and he, he owned, he made surfboards, okay? In fact, we used to call him Surfer or something or brother. It's his nickname because he was a nice guy. And he would be out on the water when the water was really, honestly, too cold for the rest of us with his wetsuits and stuff. And, he was surfing all the time. He's part of our part of our beach group that we went to see, okay. And um, one day um, he was down. We came down to the beach, climbed down the cliff to the beach, 
And he was long, he was just howling in pain, just huge pain, tears coming out of his, you know, tears coming down. He's just absolutely um, crying. And it turned out that he had, uh, if if you were looking at the beach, the, the beach there, of you know, um, near La Jolla, and you're standing on the top of the cliff. This is where Colby used to fly his hang gliders back early days. Um, if you look down in the water, you could see hundreds of stingrays out in the water that you were kind of that you didn't always see. They weren't always there, but they they were there a lot. Does that make sense? And um, you could see them up high. You when you were down in the water, you really didn't necessarily see them. But what you had to do, if you go to a beach where you know there's a lot of stingrays, is that when you walk out, you have to shuffle your feet. That's extremely important to do that. Because if you don't, you can step on one. And you do not want to step on a stingray. Some of the most painful things you can do in your life is to be victim of a stingray a sting. Okay? And so, you know, this, and, and you know, all the times we'd gone down there for several years and nobody had ever stepped on one, but our friend had. And he was just, um, he was just, in agony, and we were, it was the kind of beach where there wasn't a lifeguard handy. You couldn't get there by car. The only way you could get to this beach was climb down the cliff, which why we liked it, because there was nobody there, right? So, um, anyhow, he, um, he was, a, so, and there was, there's no first aid shack or anything like that, so um, our friend was, um, SOL as far as uh, you know getting any kind of medical help and the first thing that Colby did when he saw him in that condition first thing he did was he told everybody to get a um, he said he had somebody dump, dump out one of their coolers and we started a fire with the driftwood we started a fire on the beach with the driftwood and um, and then we had the, um, and we took some old uh, empty beer cans, or maybe dumped something out, Coke beer cans. And then uh, Colby then um, heated the, you know, but two or three, and we put them in the, you know, the coals of the fire. And then Colby. Um, took the empty uh, the empty cooler container that we emptied the sandwiches or whatever the snacks were that person had brought, okay? And he dumped the hot water in it and put our surfer friends a, um, a foot in the, in, the, in the hot water, the boil, you know, the very, very hot water, not quite boiling, but, you know, for all intents and purposes, pretty much boiling, yeah? And, uh, uh, and within uh, within a few seconds, his foot quit hurting. That was it. He was in agonizing pain, and then it quit hurting. And um, everybody said, "How did you know to do that?" And he said it was some surfing magazine he had read while he was uh, waiting for me in the grocery store to finish buying the groceries, and that's how he knew. Uh, what um, what to do? Now it's funny. Our surfing surfer guy didn't know. But Colby knew what to do, and he was the kind of person that a few um, he wasn't squeamish. Like if if you had um, if you were injured or hurt if it, in front of me, I would be. I'd feel bad for you. I'd emphasize with the pain, even. But if you wanted help, you should find somebody else, because I don't know. What could I do for you, right? Good luck with that, right? <laughs> Hope you feel better. Hope you get help. Because, I mean, I'm just absolutely, absolutely worthless in emergencies like that. But Colby was just he's the kind of person that you could, he could come on a car accident. Somebody could be lying with their guts half out and, you know, leg gone, and he would just very methodically. Um, do what was needed to do to save the person's life or 
what, whatever he could, but he, he wouldn't freak, it would not freak him out. Stuff like that never freaked him out. You know, uh, I don't know, I'm very empathic. I'm right there feeling your pain with you and I'm get, get, you know, I'm not loving it. And um, no, that would not have been a solution for me. But that was the kind of, so, so Simon's dad was the kind of guy that if you asked him to uh, 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 oh, I don't know. Let's say um, what? Build a bomb, you know, build an atomic bomb for him and gave him the parts. Um, as long as you promise not to pay him, he loved projects. His, his whole idea of, of happiness was if you had a, a problem that no one else could solve, you didn't give him any money for it to ruin the experience because money tainted apparently everything. Um, and um, but he probably would have been a good monk in some ways for that, right? But um, not in other ways. He wouldn't have qualified, but that aspect perhaps. And um, anyhow, he just, but he loved um, the challenge. The puzzle. He loved the puzzle of the problem. Does that make sense? He loved puzzles and problems, and he loved solving them. That was really fun. And um, for instance, um, uh, when my sisters and her husband came to visit when they were still married for their divorce, um, uh, we had, one of the problems we had with our pond ponds was it, it was getting because they were, it was not um, it was being fed by upstream um, by runoff okay there was silt and sand in that would our pond was starting to fill up with silt and sand so uh, I remember that he had come up with a kind of a clever way to siphon it out but it was slow and my my uh, brother-in-law was appalled at um, the way what he was, you know, how he was his solution for it. Why not just hire someone to come and dredge the pond out? You know what I mean? But uh, Colby was not about spending money. He he didn't, you know. No, we're going to spend money if you could fix it. So he might spend a couple of hours a day dredging out the pond, and that was fine. You know. Um, that kind of stuff. He, so he had a, kind of a different, different viewpoint of, of stuff that, that a lot of people might not have understood. And what, what I didn't understand was that um, um, that her dad, because it, it wasn't until we were divorced and years later that uh, that I, I didn't understand that he was on the spectrum, that he had a form of a, a, a kind of a form of autism, and that, um, and I'm trying to think of what the name is, where, you know, he, he only. Asperger's? He, what? When it Asperger's? Asperger's. Yeah, Asperger's. Uh, but when you're married to someone you've never heard of Asperger's, you just kind of think they're crazy. You know what I mean? You just see it as a new kind of crazy. You're not, I just, it just seemed crazy to me. You know, he just, um, you couldn't touch his feet. Um, I love my feet rubbed. You couldn't touch his feet. And um, um, he wore the same things every day. I don't know, though I do that now, too. I'm in the same pair of pants. I just keep washing them. I've got a lot of clothes. I'm wearing the same things. So I don't know. Maybe it's the pot calling the kettle black. But um, anyhow, he, um, he had issues. Uh, like, oh, yeah, he always had to have a canned grapefruit juice in the house not fresh can because if he got sick he totally believed that that would only cure him. I remember um, things like uh, he couldn't uh, he, he, he you know I used to like sparrows and I had a way of cooking them where I would uh, put you know skewers through them and uh, hang them uh, from one of the top racks in the oven and let them roast in there and then kind of drip down on um, uh, uh, on on a little drip pan, right? And 
I remember he said, are we out of food money? Why are we eating bones? Stuff like that, weird shit like that, you know. Didn't want to eat pizza. Had it, going to the, we would go to, we'd go out for pizza and he thought it was excessive. And um, um, so everybody could have one pizza pizza and he was obsessed with everybody's weight and not getting fat and he had, he had some issues, okay? But he was a brilliant guy, he still is. You know, at 87, you know what he's doing now? In 87, he is bopping around California on, uh, and riding his um, electric bicycle off-roading with kids uh, 20 years old, seriously, up in the mountains and falling into rocks and having great, what we used to call them Donnybrooks. Do you remember that term, John, Donnybrook? Have you ever heard that? No. You had a Donnybrook? Donnybrook, no. Yeah, that's where you, you just crash and you wish you hadn't. Nope. He was a, kind of a fearless in that sense. He had trained to be an Olympic uh, skier. The problem was he didn't. He was not a person that cared about winning. Winning meant nothing to him. Um, and they, the coach couldn't use him because he, he really just couldn't get behind winning. And, you know, when you're in a sport, they really expect you to. That's one of the things they. You know, by the way, we're here to win. What is your deal, right? What is your deal? So that being, that being said, it, it was a bit of a challenge in that way because um, he, you know, he had different things. You know, things motivate people. You know, what is it that gets you up in the morning kind of thing, right? What is it that makes you get up as opposed to just staying in bed and swallowing pills and never getting up, getting out of bed? You know, what gets you up? And he was fascinated by just the projects that he was working on. He had all, you know, we each had a workshop in the basement in Aspen, and we had, we built one in uh, California. And he absolutely loved, uh, Working on stuff and building things, and uh, I think we told we told his story about an Aspen. He was always fixing people's stuff for him. He liked doing that. He liked working with his hands. But um, his father, sadly, Colby was raised in Wyoming on a sheep ranch, and his dad dad died when he was uh, ten. And uh, his mother married. The, um, and they had a ranch for him, and they had a big sheep company. And it was a big operation, and something that Betty couldn't have possibly managed by herself. She needed help. And uh, uh, so um, eventually, she, uh, Colby went off to board. He, they sent him off to mil military school for high school because he didn't get along with the ranch foreman at all. That, that, oh my God, he looked like, the guy that she married looked just like, uh, like Festus in, in um, remember Festus in? Uh, oh yeah, what Gunsmoke? Was that? Yeah, remember that Gunsmoke, Festus? That's yeah. who she married. He came from the south, there was like 12 kids in his family, their family tree didn't fork, you know, a lot of incest and whatever that was, right? And um, I mean, uh, Anyway, Betty, and, and he was the he had been the ranch foreman, and Betty had mar mar married him, and Colby couldn't stand him. And anyway, he ended up to boarding school. But before that, um, his father had set him up, you know, like for instance on the ranch and stuff. His his father had wanted to go to medical school. Uh, his the family was uh, was uh, Danish immigrants. And um, when it, uh, his, his father was a kid, uh, you know, he got really good grades. And, you know, his dream, his whole dream, his whole life was to be in medical, you know, was to go to, bed, was go, was to, go to medical school. But because he was the oldest and, you know, came from this old school family, family family uh, tradition, uh, his father would hear none of that, and um, 
he had to take over the sheep ranch, the sheep company. And his brother, who wanted the, the sheep company in the worst way, his younger brother, ended up going to college. Somebody had to go to college, and his dad is the one that wanted to go and be a doctor. Probably when Colby got the good hands and you know, that, that from inherited that. But his uncle became an attorney and extremely unhappy, Uncle Harold. See, these stories are kind of rambling around as I just sort of remember this stuff, right? And um, Uncle Harold just was so unhappy that never, never liked, never got along with his brother and just so jealous of the fact that his brother inherited this sheep company and he didn't. So he, as an attorney in Wyoming, he was um, likable, and uh, apparently. And I think I only met him one time. And the family, the family did not get along. And at th that time, I remember Colby saying something. When he was younger, Harold had gone bald. And Colby had very tight curls on his head, really thick hair. And he used to say hi to his uncle. He'd have to say hi to his uncle at some sort of family party. He would, uh, you know, always rub his rub his hands through his hair just to kind of get him. Did it on purpose. It was a, <laughs> kind of petty revenge. But anyway, it it came out later that Harold um, had been the attorney for a lot of the ranches in that area back in what, Rollins, Wyoming, and had written the wills so the widows got nothing, and he ended up as with the sheep ranches. He ended up with a lot of sheep ranches and ranches because he basically stole them from because cause that's what he wanted. Anyway, Colby's dad didn't want the sheep company, hated it, had to run it. And uh, so he wanted Colby to learn about business. So, uh, oh, he, would, he would let him, for instance, raise, they, they had sheep dogs. And so if the, sometimes um, he could you know, you know, raise the, you know, the puppies or, um, uh, uh, you know, maybe raise the bum lambs. And then his father said, he never wanted that because that he'd spent all this time working, the promise of, oh, yeah, when we sell these, we'll make all this money. Well, when they sold the lambs and everything and they made the money, he deducted rent and he deducted all this other stuff so that Colby never made any money, you know, on the sheep. And all he saw was that he was just a failure. So he didn't, he didn't like money, didn't like, it had the absolutely opposite effect of, of what his dad was trying to do. And then uh, before it could be reconciled, and also his dad was very violent and apparently very fond of Colby's sister, Joanne, who was like three years younger. And one time he, he, said, he tells the story of how his dad was mad at something he'd done and had uh, uh, taken the, the picket fence in the backyard, the white little picket fence people have, and had pulled off a broken uh, fence thing and had the picket and had been spanking him with it and did almost fourth of the fence on his back. Beat the, just beat him, really, beat him. Beat him. He, he sounded like a very unhappy, not nice person. Um, and, you know, well, you could well understand where, um, you know, some of this, you know, some of the violence that he did display, you know, he kind of grew up with it, uh, with, with that stuff. So anyway, uh, Her Her Harold had stolen all these ranches and stuff. And, uh, but we never had, um, uh, we never had anything to do with Harold, and, and Colby's mother married this other guy, and then they were divorced soon after I met him. They, I think they were still married when, um, when Colby and I got married, um, but he was Uncle Festus, that wasn't his name, but that's what he looked like, was, was in the basement in a separate room. But, he was gallivanting around town having fairs. And, I mean, Rollins, Wyoming is such a small town. It was back in those days, it was such a small place. 
and um, uh, you really, everybody knew everybody's business. And you know, there were stories about the lady when her husband sold all the sheep and she ran off to Las Vegas and took the money and bought a Cadillac and broke, you know, family fed broke because she went out and gambled it all. And I mean, everybody knew everybody's business, okay? And Colby's sister, who and him never got along, couldn't stand each other. And I think it was because Colby's mother loved Colby. I mean, she just doted on him. I didn't. I did, never really caught on about this business between, you know, mothers and sons, and how that that di dynamic works. I saw it in the relationships, but, you know, my mother didn't have any particular feelings for my brothers over anybody else. In fact, she kind of detested them. So I was I was really amazed at the. Um, uh, that the devotion, you know, that, that Betty felt for her son and didn't feel that at all for her daughter. And so when um, Joanne got married before Colby, because Colby was uh, almost 29 when he married me, so she, Joanne got married before then, and, and she married this kid, and um, they're in Wyoming, and she was, you know, they're married to him, and and they had gotten, they were old enough to get some of their inheritance from their father that his father had left in trust. So Colby had opened this trampoline center. Do you guys remember when the trampoline centers were just all the rage? You guys remember that? Um, well, Colby had opened one, and he took, so he they took turns operating it. So sometimes Joanne's, uh, uh, would, when Joanne, Jan would, Joanne would run it, and then Eddie would do it, and then Colby would do it, okay? And so, but the nights, the, the, regardless of what day it was, because it all, you know, depending if they were taking turns like that, sometimes you got it on the weekend, and sometimes you didn't, right? Um, uh, they were all. They were the the till was always short. They were always lost money, the day, um, uh, the day that um, Joanne's husband was running. You know, worked on it, and basically he was stealing from from Colby. And um, well, you can imagine that didn't go over very well. But I mean, he was family, so he got away with it. Does that make sense? He family, so. He, he definitely did get away with it to an extent. Because, again, because he was family. And later, um, and, and, and he had to be careful. He couldn't say anything. But he, and of course, Joanne stuck up for him. But eventually, whatever was going on in their marriage, Joanne divorced him. She was probably about in her twenties. She divorced him. And and it all happened because he needed money. And he um, decided that um, he, he sent a. Um, a note to the sheriff or some some rich businessman in town and said unless the man left some money in an envelope in the old churchyard he was going to um, kidnap their daughter and kill her or something like that. He actually said that? Yeah, he actually did that. He actually, yeah. Yeah, that's what he did. Is he not so cuckoo? Well, I mean, he didn't kidnap the kid. He didn't even have the person, right? I mean, one thing, if he kidnapped her, right? So he's just giving a, a foreshadowing. Yeah, it, it, she will be kidnapped unless you give me some money. Okay? Thinking he, they might get some, he might get some money and he'd never get caught. Sheriffs were sort of, you know, what, what could they do, right? I know, you guys, it's so crazy, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And so... 
guess what? They, uh, the, she, the, he went to the cemetery that night, and it was agreed upon. The person had said, yes, I'll pay the ransom, even though I don't know. I don't know if he kidnapped her or what. I don't think he actually kidnapped her. But he was paying the ransom, but who would, right, if he hadn't kidnapped anybody yet? But apparently they were going to, went to the police, because the note had said, don't go to the police, all this stuff, right? And... Um, it just seems Looney Tunes. I know, and so then, it, you know, just like in the, the, the movies, the police just moved in and arrested him. <laughs> and and get, this is Wyoming. And the guy that he had threatened was liked, I don't know if that would have made a difference. I think it wouldn't have mattered, but just saying he was liked by the townsfolk, right? And um, uh, he went to jail. He was sentenced to jail for like 10 years in prison for this. It was pretty serious. So thus they were divorced. She can't imagine why. And Joanne really couldn't live down the shame of um, her husband going to prison and uh, ex-husband or whatever it was. So long and be lo and behold, I guess, right? Um, it's kind of fun painting this, telling you this story, because you don't get to tell people stories like this. Oh, yeah, my sister's husband tried to kidnap somebody and went to prison. And I really can't remember if he actually went through with the kidnapping. Twin, you might have. can't remember. But he certainly went, you know, they certainly caught him in the cemetery. And, uh, and his name was Eddie, I think was his name. Again, I never met him, this, you know. So, um, Joanne went on to college, and she got her master's in teaching, and she became a teacher. Um, somebody else didn't know what, what happened. Oh, by the way, what, what happened to Joanne? That's what happened to her. When you were cleaning the brushes, did you see that dagger brush I had out? It's, it was a small one. So you put it over here, okay? I put it back where I always put it. Yeah, them. thank you. Everybody goes back in their spot. Everybody goes back, right? Where I find them. Where I think they belong. So it was a co colorful, and I don't think Colby ever quite let her get, a, you know, you know how kids are. Well, yeah, your husband, yeah, Eddie, how's prison going, stuff like that. You know? <laughs> I don't know, but like she was not, it, 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 she was not, uh, uh, she was never, she was not a big fan of Colby and because her dad because his her dad you know really favored her but her mother did not and uh, Betty would deny it I'm sure if you had said well, you you don't like your daughter as well but um, trust me um, I could even I could see it that she just uh, that she didn't. So back to back to, so that was his, um, uh, his life in Wyoming, you know, kind of changed him. Um, he had the kind of life where they worked all the time, the sheep ranch, and they were, um, e even on the, um, in summer, they had places to be, so they moved the whole cattle ranch out to, Colorado in the summer, and then Colby worked with his dad out there, too. So he wasn't a kid, he kid. He was a kid that didn't grow up with television. I remember I grew up with television. He was ten years older than I was, so he, you know, we liked it. So he was fascinated by American Bandstand, and used to watch it with Cinnamon on Saturdays, even though the man did not like to dance. Now this had been one thing if he liked to dance or something, I could have understood it, but he would. He, he watched that religiously, which I thought was very odd. He just had some odd things about him that were, besides wearing the, we had a, he had the same t-shirt he wore with a, we designed it, with him. it was yellow and black, and it was, a, it was black with a, 
with a hand glider. It was uh, a hand glider on it. And we had them custom made 10 at a time from a little shop, a surfing shop down in uh, Laguna Beach. And that was his clothes. It didn't like those, you know, these clothes. So he had all these little idiosyncrasies that perhaps could have been explained if you'd understood. But I didn't understand. Um, and again, I didn't understand. I'd never heard of Ashburners. I didn't understand it. So he, he was a bit of a challenge to live with. Um, I don't know if that would have made any difference, though, as far as, I mean, he was just a challenge to live with. That was just, that was just it. So anyway, we had this, we had this property in California, and we rode horses, and we, Cinnamon had a, a, a pony named uh, Whiskey. And we had these interesting, um, we had these interesting neighbors. And June Isaacs, uh, her, uh, brother was married to Catherine Grayson, the actress. And C Catherine, um, uh, so, and she grew up in the old Hollywood. So I think I've told you, uh, in another video, I've told you a little bit about her, you know, June's experience with the, um, her son. And June's son uh, really had not been particularly successful in life at anything, as far as I could tell, her son. And, um, and her, again, her brother is long since dead, but he did have this aunt who... Um, had uh, given him uh, those red skeleton paintings, two of them, that they were um, in the basement. Did I talk about how, the, how this came about, John, the red skeleton paintings? No, you did not. So apparently, back in the, in the glamour of, of Hollywood, back in those days, um, they would have these elaborate parties, okay? And um, the, the Christmas parties. And everybody would bring gifts. And uh, Red Skelton always gave this, had given this lady on two different occasions um, paintings of his. And, you know, they were clowns, and it, you, you either like clowns or you don't, but um, his paintings ended up in the basement. And um, uh, back when, she, you know, when Catherine Grayson, you know, was a, uh, you know, was a big deal singer, and back when she was, you know, famous, uh, the whole family worked for her. J June, June, uh, June's job was to get her to the studio because the whole family was living off of the money she was making. Okay, her family, and so um, June's job was to get this woman up in the mornings, and um, into and 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 onto the studio because she 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 couldn't. She had to get there on time, you know, she had to get there, and she never could seem to get herself self, uh, there on time. So then uh, they they trick her with the clocks and everything. And let's sit here, maybe let that dry while we do some other stuff, right? So anyhow, so June, I was always fun. We used to go over there and, and talk to June because she had these great, she had great stories of you know life in Hollywood. And, you know, if you, you know, quite frankly, June was just amazingly interesting. Yeah. And but one of my favorite stories about June was that her husband that she was married to was a mechanic. And um, really, just um, the kind of guy you might see in a, a, re a repair shop, uh, coveralls, old. When I knew him, she was in her 60s. He just liked, was like an old guy. And, um, you know, nothing, nothing particularly outstandingly interesting about him. He did, 
he was a mechanic, and he, I don't, he had a little place where he worked and so forth. But, and in June they had a they had a June's son was from a first marriage I think, and they, but their daughter Rowena, they had later in life, and everybody doted on Rowena. Um, and you know Rowena could do no wrong, and so. The, both she and her husband did, did dote on Irina, on on her, quite a bit. So the um, one Christmas, we had gotten there was June's house up on the road, and then there was um, uh, up the, you know kind of up the hill from us, you know on the way out to Lone Jack, she had a house, and then there was another lady that had a house. Uh, uh, so there was just three houses on our driveway that all went out to the street, okay? And of course, as neighbors, we all we were all friends. And so June particularly, because she was home alone, she didn't have anything particularly to do, and the other ladies didn't work either. Um, they spent probably a lot more time with them than I did. I mean, I'd, I'd go over and see, see them, but nothing like, they talk on the phone and all that stuff. So one of the th interesting things we talk about Christmas that her June's husband came home one day right before the holidays and all excited he said I have gotten you something for Christmas that it, it's for you and Rowena I can't talk it's a it's a surprise it's for you and Rowena okay and. So June spent the mo that month speculating on what wonderful prize their husband had gotten her for Christmas. And she's thinking, well, you know, I mean, I, and I remember listening to her. She says, that maybe, she said, maybe it's this mink coat. She thought that would have been a good gift, that she and Rowena could share a mink coat. She'd always wanted one. And wouldn't that be great, right, the mink coat? Yeah. And... Um, she went this long list of stuff that she thought that she was going to get for Christmas from, from her husband, who wasn't known for his... No, he wasn't a cheap man. He just... He lived with these women, but he didn't get it. Do you know what I mean? He was just a passenger in the house, is the way I see it, right? But I, I, I don't think he, for a clue, uh, uh, understood his wife. If he would, if he did, he never would have pulled that off at Christmas like he did. So, um, as it as it turned out, uh, 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 she had a terrible Christmas. She was not happy at all with what she got because what he ended up getting her was a um, spray nozzle. They were they just come out. Spray nozzle for the kitchen sink. So when you did the dishes, you could, not even a dishwasher, you guys, you could just use this nifty spray model nozzle and, and it, you could easily spray the dishes. Um, uh, <laughs> just not understanding why his wife was so upset by that, okay? And you have to understand is that June had these dogs and they had fleas. And I remember going over to her house one day, and the house was infested, and her legs were covered with black fleas. Are you going, ooh, yet? Housekeeping, you gotta understand that the housekeeping wasn't this lady's priority. You know what I mean? She barely, she didn't have a maid or anything, but she was not, this was not her thing, or there would have never been fleas all over the house, right? And, um, so anyhow, uh, so she says, and, and then she's, and then she talked about this lady down the street. She was telling me she was so upset that she got this, because she had, of course, been speculating with me about what she was going to get for Christmas too. And uh, then to find out that she was um, got this spray nozzle, right? <laughs> I mean, even I understood that was a stupid gift, right? I mean, really, a spray nozzle? Well, I, I would have probably enjoyed it. Um, well, I know, it's like the time, uh, 
what is it that George got me one time for my birthday? It was old electric toothbrush, and Cinnamon just gave him heck for that. She, that's not a birthday present, you know? You know? Just... <laughs> oh, that's a thoughtful gift, isn't it? Well, I mean, some people don't get gifts, right? They don't get, they don't really get the idea of giving gifts. They don't really get it like they're supposed to, my, my feeling, right? And so anyway, uh, Uh, so then June was going on about how that the lady down the street, oh my God, you can't believe what she got for Christmas. And she yeah. got... Fancy nozzle? No, she said, oh my God, now her husband loves her. And I mean, he, he, he's wonderful. And, and she says, and you can't believe what, what she got for Christmas. And I said, well, what, what did she... So I went down and then I had coffee with the other neighbor because I was dying to know um, what she got for Christmas, right? That made June, June so envious. And she's and this and I think it came out because I said, "Well, how, how was your Christmas?" You know how you always say to people, "How was your Christmas?" Right? You say that. And she she said, um, uh, "It was terrible." Her Christmas. I'm gonna have to put some paint on. I guess I'm gonna quit fooling around here, but running out of paint. I'm liking my path. Are you guys? So, for those of you who are just following me, this is not a tutorial. This is uh, this painting has been already been sold. We're doing story time. It's already been claimed too. Huh? It's been claimed. Has it? Yep. Nanette who fly said she'll take it. <laughs> and I said, you want her to finish it or like it like it is? <laughs> She'd rather have it finished. So. Oh, good to know, right? Yeah, it's trying to save you some time, babe. Thank you. She didn't fall for it. Um, so, um, anyhow, in, in those days, there's a lot of those days, but you got to appreciate this. In those days, she, um, now I've kind of got off track here with this. Uh, anyway, this is not a tutorial, but we were welcome to story time telling you about life with June Isaacs. And so, in the neighbor, and I can't remember what the other neighbor's name was, but, um, uh, and I apologize, I just can't remember her name. Um, uh, so, saying I need some phthalo green out here, so excuse me a minute while I uh, reclaim that. So I went over to this other lady's house, and I said, so what did you, I hear you got these great Christmas gifts. And she says, oh my God, my husband's such a fool. I got these terrible, terrible Christmas gifts. And I said, but June said <laughs> that they were marvelous. Got all this great stuff, right? And she says, well, she said, um, I guess she'd gotten a belt buckle, some cowboy boots, and one other thing. Okay. And she says, he got me this stupid Western belt buckle. And I had mentioned to him that I, you know, because I had won the President's Cup with my, um, with my horseback riding. And I had these, I had these beautiful, you know, one of the awards was like these amazing belt, belt buckles. Sometimes I'll have to show you them. They were pretty, they're big deal on my horseback riding. Okay. And, um, uh, and she says, why on earth would I want a belt buckle? And uh, well, look at pants. And then she got some, uh, I don't know, it was like these cowboy boots. And she didn't like those either. She had a big reason why she didn't like those, and they were dumb, and you know. And then the whole gist of it was that he bought her a bunch of stuff she did not want, couldn't believe. He had the audacity to give that stuff to her, and it was the worst Christmas ever. And yet here we had June, who perceived this as the other lady so much winning more than her. And I just thought it was so, um, oh, it's such an O. Henry story, wasn't it? Of these two women, who everybody was getting something that they, you know, everybody imagined someone else 
doing better. And I used to say that cinnamon, because life can be tough for everybody. And those of you listening, I know life can be tough and everybody's got stories sometime in their life, except for that one lady who's worth the experience and her whole life was driving on a gravel road. There's very few of those people <laughs> in life. Most that people have one, got a lot more trauma than that, okay? I'm just saying, you know what I mean, right? They have. And Life can be tough, but I think that a lot of times we imagine that we're on a type rope, we're walking, our life is like a walking, type, rope, type rope walking, and um, all our other, and all our friends are, have planks. They're walking on a plank. Maybe not that easy, but they've got a plank, and you're just bopping along here with them. Um, uh, um, uh, on this precarious wire and every once in a while some fool twangs it. Yeah? I think that um, I see that uh, more, you know, often. And Cinnamon said, oh, Mom, you're such a cynic. I said, no, I'm not. I said, I think that that's you know, you perceive you're the only one with these problems. And everybody's got problems, and so we know that. But anyway, I thought it was so interesting about June and the belt buckle and the Christmas belt buckle. One of my favorite stories to tell is the story of Elise Proctor. Back when Cinnamon was a baby, we lived in Aspen. And for a very short time in our lives, we had joined a church, a religious church, called Jehovah's Witnesses. Some of you may have heard of them. Okay, I know. And some of you still may be one. So, um, and what I will say about being a Jehovah's Witness, even though it's not a belief system that I have uh, currently, um, nicest people you will ever meet in your whole life and most honest, trustworthy. Um, if I was going to hire anybody, I'd hire a Jehovah's Witness because I knew that they would never—they would never cheat me, ever. That's how uh, certain I am about them. But one of the tenets of Jehovah's Witnesses was, of course, they, you know, had a belief back then, and really strongly back then. It changes from time to time. Um, is that they—they they really believed that the that the world was coming to an end and that God was going to personally come down and wipe out most of humanity. And really, when you read the news, you could see why that's almost gratifying, the thought, okay, I don't have to fix this, but you all, you fools, you're all going to get it kind of thing, right? Some sort of satisfaction in that. I know that sounds terrible, but come on, you guys, really, let's, try, let's be honest, right? So anyway, then, and we were close to a nuclear war in those days when Colby and I joined the church. And uh, one of the things you had to do was go door to door, and you know, you know, do this, you know, and convince people that they ought to, you know, take, a, you know, have a watchtower. You know, we were told things like, you know, if they can't afford the ten cents with the watchtower, tell them that you'll t t trade them for some Jello. Because, uh, by the way, we we didn't get those watchtowers for free. We had to buy them. A lot of people don't know that we had to buy them. Okay, and. Um, so, anyway, Elise was, we had a whole congregation, because back in the here hippie days, we had a whole congregation of young kids that had come to um, Aspen to ski or whatever and were disillusioned with the world and, you know, um, and the wars and all this stuff. And, and they, they wanted, um, you know, the idea that something else was going to fix it because they didn't see how mankind was going to fix it. And... It, it was a very inter it was a very cheerful message. God was going to fix it eventually, you know. And everybody would live happy. The story goes, everybody will live happily ever after. Just follow us. Everybody will live happily ever after, you know. And so, um, Elise. But one of the, you know, um, very much like a lot of religions, not just um, Jehovah's Witnesses, but um, uh, people. You, you're generally supposed to kind of marry in your own faith. I mean, this is not unusual. 
um, uh, that that's that is definitely not an unusual thing. Uh, uh, most religions, um, Catholics are supposed to marry Catholics. Jews, Jewish people are supposed to marry Jewish people. Muslims marry Muslims. That's just how it goes, right? So Jehovah's Witnesses were supposed to marry other Jehovah's Witnesses, and there, but there was unless you it was hard to meet people, and unless there was at the con, unless you went to one of their conventions to meet other people in your your group. But we were lucky. We had a lot of. We had a lot of uh, uh, males as well as young females in, in our congregation. Um, and at least, and the girls wanted to be prepared, wanted to appear, I know this sounds very, <laughs> sorry to say, wanted to appear particularly devout so that um, besides being pretty, being devout, you know, was perceived as a way of perhaps, you know, um, you know, catching in the way I saw it, I'm not saying that they ever preached that, but I'm just saying that that was sort of my feeling from talking to them, that they thought that you know maybe a, a man would be much more likely to like a devout person. You know, so you know they were all out, de out, devout, out, devouting each other, <laughs> just you know, out, 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 trying to outdo each other on who was who was more faithful and religious and all that stuff. Yeah, so so. I, do you hear the cynic in me? But, you know, there was a little of that. You know, I have to tell you, there was a little of that. But this is absolutely one of my all-time favorite stories and a less, life lesson for all. And uh, Joe's Witnesses didn't have ministers. They had elders. They had like, a head elder and other elders. And so if you had a problem, you would go talk to the elders. Okay? And Bud Hasty was his parents, um, the Kingdom Hall, which was their church, was on his property. He'd given it to the church. They, they had some property and pretty rich. And uh, uh, he was a bachelor, uh, never married. Almost came close to marrying a friend of mine, but he never did. So anyhow, at least one of the things that you, you, know, you, you did was you went out and you went door to door and uh, just putting my tree in, so I have to think a minute here, you guys. And and and, and, and tell people that they, you know, that watch and, 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 and encourage people for Bible study and taking a watchtower, okay? And so Lise was out in the countryside there. Um, kind of out of town. It wasn't, wasn't, and it was on the other side of the river, and it was really kind of, there wasn't nothing out there in those days. Uh, just a trailer park and a few uh, uh, individual homes, you know what I mean? And she had been out there with her, out there by herself, and in those days you could wander around in the world by yourself and feel pretty safe. Now women, and you know, that's another story, but in those days, uh, you know, you could do that. So she, like I say, she had been out there by herself, um, and needed the restroom. So um, there was a young man in our congregation who was about 18 or 19. He'd, I think he left home earlier and had a bad life with his parents or whatever. Nice kid. And um, he could barely feed himself. And he'd often come to the, the you know, church on um, Sundays or during the week, and he'd have two different colored socks on, and he always looked like he'd slept in his clothes. And everybody liked him; he's a sweet kid. But he, he just it was the feeling is that maybe he'd left home too soon. You know what I mean? That he really, really wasn't ready to be out in the world. Um, just from a standpoint, is he couldn't really take care of himself for a while, right? So, Elise. Uh, Uh, so, so I'm just kind of looking at my picture while I'm telling you this, right? So she knocks on his door, his trailer door, and she says, you know, can I use your bathroom? And of course he says, sure, come on in. And that was safe, and she didn't want to knock, you know, so she knew someone that lived there, and so she loves, and she, she left his house, and the first thing she do, did was go to Bud Hasey's house 
and say she had to talk to him urgently and start crying. And she just, she was crying. She was sobbing really uncontrollably. And uh, he couldn't get her for the longest time to tell her even what had happened, except that she'd been out to this kid's house, his trailer, tried to use the restroom. And that's as far as she got before. Um, uh, she burst into tears. I know, pretty serious, pretty serious, right? Sounds and right. and then finally, she was able to. It says you've got to talk to him. So she kept saying, "You've got to talk to him." You have to talk to him. And so, well, he said, Bud said, well, sure, you know, sure, Lisa, calm down. What am I supposed to talk to him about? Okay? And she says, she said, she said I went to his house, and um, he didn't have any toilet paper in his bathroom. He just had this, and she's sobbing as she tells it. He just has this rag hanging on the wall with brown spots all over it. And then she thought she was going to faint. She'd never seen anything like that in her life, couldn't believe it. And she says, um, you know, and then she left Bud's house. And, you know, that's a pretty good story, isn't it? I mean, all by itself. Can you believe, you know, one of those? Can you believe it? Can you believe it? Really? You know, one of those kind of stories? Yeah. <laughs> Just so pretty soon, <laughs> half the congregation knew that this poor boy didn't use toilet paper, but was re relic, relic, just kept a rag on his wall. And um, and that was the, his substitute for toilet paper. Seriously. And, and it's so, his mother never told him, or maybe he doesn't have any money, or whatever the thing was. All the speculation on what had happened to him, right? Okay, so, so that afternoon in the the uh, that 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 very afternoon or that evening it was like a Thursday night meeting and Bud always gave some opening remarks before the other stuff started and so he he starts and he says um, says I want to talk to you guys about gossip and jumping to conclusions and because apparently, after this had happened, but but of course it went over to his house to see what the situation was. And uh, what um, Elise Proctor had mistaken for his um, uh, his toilet paper was his shoe shine rag. So what he shined his shoes with. He did have toilet paper. She just didn't see it. She just jumped to conclusions and decided that that was his. Uh, that's just that was just how he did. Come on, it's a great story, isn't it? Sh shoe shine rag. Yep. So that was a good. And of course, she was mortified. And of course, the kid was mortified too. That everybody thought that uh, so little of him and uh, how he lived that um, that he didn't know the difference. You know, so it was a thing. But. That was a great lesson to me in, um, in just never jumping to conclusions about things and giving people the benefit of the doubt. Because sometimes it's hard to give people the benefit of the doubt. You, we put motives behind people and assign motives. Um, somebody doesn't say hi to you in, a, um, in the store when you walk by and you know they saw them and they and you you were going through your mind going I must have done something what did I do must have done something why aren't they talking to me right and conversely um, it could just be as as uh, probable that they didn't see you um, there's a famous artist and I think his last name is Close but I don't know, close, something close. And he grew up, and, and they discovered this as, a, as an actual disease people have. He grew up 
not being able to recognize faces. So um, even his own mothers. Now this is an actually disorder. And the people, you know how like you immediately see somebody, if you know them, you recognize them, right? And how people like that get along in the world, <coughs> they might remember you wear your hair up in a, in a bun or something else that they, that's recognizable about you. <coughs> so, um, Uh, then that's how he identified it. And he went into, he took up portrait painting um, to try to train his mind to see things about people. That's how he became a famous portrait artist because he needed to um, you know, have that ability. And then later he was in some sort of accident and he was a, uh, he paints with his mouth. He's a, a quadriplegic, and he. I was in um, Chicago. Um, remember, I told you about IGI, uh, you know, uh, that art gallery that um, that's you know kind of went under and cheated everybody. That's in yesterday's story, so you'll have to watch that one to hear about it. But there was a trial. I don't. I didn't mention this, but I'll mention it today. There was a trial, and. Um, uh, somebody was uh, suing the guy about something, and we were told that if we would testify on his behalf, we would get our artwork back or paid or something. It was a big lawsuit thing. Uh, and so I had, they had gone, I'd gone up to the city, of, I'd gone up to Chicago and um, stayed in this, ho this hotel that the, company paid for um, and uh, had the, had a free day so I went to this art museum in Chicago of modern art and uh, the, the neat thing uh, really um, neat thing uh, was this one painting it was huge it's like size of a wall was hanging there and it was all little squares with little dots inside the squares that he had, he had painted with his mouth I don't know how long it took him to paint it it was amazing and it was of a person and anyway if you just you just never know do you so um, anyhow just you know jumping to conclusions is not something you want to do and giving people the benefit of the doubt is was one of my takeaways from that um, experience of t my time with them. And uh, but I'll, I have to tell you, I'll never forget Elise Proctor. And my, you know, her um, shoe shine, the shoe shine rag. Oh, let's see. So. Back when we lived in California, Cinnamon, uh, you know, um, she uh, went to public school and then she went to um, uh, then she went to private school. But when she was in high school, she was back to riding the bus. And uh, there was a girl down the street that um, also had horses that she was friends with. And uh, apparently they had made great friends with the bus driver. All these greens on this log here. And uh, 
school apparently cinnamon was not real fond of school i mean no surprise there i mean who really is but uh she particularly didn't like it and um, figured out ways where she d didn't have to go and from an early age she kind of figured out things she just didn't want to do with school and so one time she talked the bus driver into taking them to down into San Diego, which was like with the bus. And they went to the mall instead of going to school. And she didn't, I found out about that years later. She didn't want to, you know, of course, if the at school had found out, the woman would have been, guess what, fired. Although she had done that. But, uh, Let's see, I'm sitting there thinking about things I can, I, I like this, it's kind of weird sharing all these strange little stories of people. And we, we didn't do a lot of skiing after Cinnamon was born. We did a lot of skiing, snow skiing before she was, but after Cinnamon was born, um, her dad and I didn't. And So we still, you know, he was flying hand gliders and you know, we were in California and he was doing stuff like that. And we eventually, um, we did some, we had this, um, this motor home that we pulled with the car and we did go on trips and stuff with this GMC. What was, well, that one was a, was a, it was before we got the motorhome, so that had to have been our Airstream travel trailer that we used. And we went on trips. And um, there was a place in, we used to like to go to Moab, Utah, and, um, you know, ride the motorcycles and uh, these little trail bikes we had and um, into the mountains. And kind of, they're very, you know, like a Trail 90, something like that, but not real big bikes. And, um, Cinnamon was a baby, and, and Colby had done um, had done a really cute crib in the motorhome, or in the airstream travel trailer for him. We, we had a we had a like a crib and stuff, and we had a, a, a um, we could carry the we could carry the boat on the top of it, and we could um, we had a motorcycle rack where we could um, uh, where he could put the. Um, uh, The two, the two of Trail 90 bikes. And then he had a car seat on there for her so that when we went biking up in the mountains or when we were riding up into the, you know, there were all these mining trails up there in Colorado where we could go. And um, uh, so she would ride with us. And I can remember her as a little baby even. You know, she's riding on the back of his motorcycle on a car seat. And... Um, poking him in the back going, careful daddy, careful daddy, because she was big, you know, uh, on that. So, um, Cinnamon, uh, same thing, was Moab, Utah, motorcycles. We, we had been riding all day out there in the, in the you know Canyonlands, Utah, the bikes, and my cinnamon was um, riding with them, um, with her dad, and I was on my bike, and um, my bike went down on a gravel road, and I fell down, and um, I didn't break anything, but I had skinned my hands, just up to, like this, hands, both hands. And, and they were all full of gravel. And we had traveled without any kind of pain medication at all. We didn't 
travel with barely any kind of first aid kit, but nothing for pain. Or we didn't, we weren't drinkers, so we didn't have any alcohol with us. And we had to get that. We had to get the um, the you know we had to get the um, uh, the gravel out of my hands so they didn't get infected. And we there was no doctor. We were miles away from. We were hours away from anybody. Okay. Absolutely hours away. So. Her dad proceeded to, you know, try to get, it's very good, you know, he didn't freak out or anything. He's very good about trying to get the, uh, uh, you know, clean my hands. But every time he touched him, I was just screaming my head off because it was painful, okay? And we were in a trailer park. And I know the neighbors heard us, and there were a lot of people there were actually from Aspen. The guy that owned the mechanic shop was there. We didn't, hadn't talked to him, but it turned out later he was there, and he'd heard me screaming. And they, everybody was trying to decide what to do. Now, this is so interesting. This is what um, nobody did anything. Nobody came and knocked on the door and said, is any, anybody OK in there? They assumed that he was beating the poo out of me. And nobody wanted to interfere. And I think that is so interesting to me that nobody was willing to come to my aid. Now, if they had, they might have had some booze or some other first aid or something for the pain. And they might have, might have been very helpful, yeah? But nobody did anything. And later, when we, and of course, we bandaged my hands and we got the gravel out. We had to actually use a toothbrush to get it out. It was painful. Um, we never traveled after that without a better first aid kit and um, some sort of pain medication, even though we never ever needed it again. We never traveled anywhere without it. And later, one woman uh, came up to me afterwards and saw the big bandage on my hand and said, are you all right? And I said, yeah, I took a terrible fall on the motorcycle and scraped my hands all up. And telling you what, cleaning the gravel out was really something. And she said, no, <laughs> you're going, surely not. But I'm going, yeah, she said, yeah, we heard you uh, screaming. <laughs> and we couldn't decide coming. what to do, and we finally decided if the baby started screaming, then we'd come help. We heard the kids <laughs> screaming. They were they were willing to come save the baby. How have I ever told you that story, John? No. They were willing to come save the baby. Apparently, apparently, they were willing to let him kill me in the desert. And there was, you know, it just it was extraordinary to me. Uh, That, that that's how that was, yeah? Um, I'm using a dagger brush if anybody wants to know what this is. I'm just going to tell you, it's, a, uh, it's a, called a triangle, silver triangle number. Um, put my glasses on. XM, XSM, you might want to put that in the credits. Someone will want to know, because this has been the best brush for doing these pictures. Um, really, honestly, it's been terrific. Uh, yeah, that was weird. I mean, just, it's funny how you re you remember things, uh, you know, a bit and past, and you know where did this, you know. It's no wonder there's so much domestic violence if nobody's willing to step in and help, right? Uh, not that he had done anything, but you know he could have been, right? And they just said, "Yeah, if the baby had been crying, we would have come to help you," which is uh, good to know, right?
so th those were we did we did a lot of when we moved to California we pretty much stopped all the um, the riding with the motorcycles that pretty much all stopped and um, uh, but back then we did a lot of we used to go uh, tra trail riding up on the the mount you know we Aspen had all these old mining trails and stuff and so we would you know ride the bikes and uh, we had a little group of gut people that we we rode with that were wonderful and um, a nice group of friends and we had this one guy that rode with us he was in the south and he uh, he was part of our little gang of bike riders, and we would go camping. We actually go camping up in the. You know, we had our camping stuff, and well, when we first went, we didn't have any camping stuff. Then we started got a little smarter, and we started taking it. But there was a time when we had no camping stuff, and uh, we were out there on our bikes. This was before Cinnamon was born, and. Um, and we had to we we couldn't get back for the night. We had to spend the night out, and we built built a fire. And um, Colby said he spent the night up keeping me from rolling into the fire because I kept trying to get closer to it. John can imagine that, right? Yep, absolutely. But uh, we carried it carried a chainsaw, and we would jump logs and. Uh, just explore, explore. It was it, those were some fun times. I mean, they really were some, some, some fun times, with the, um, with the you know the bikes and our club and stuff. There was this one guy. We called him Gentleman George. He was a French, and he was the. He was the head of the Chamber of Commerce, and he rode with us. And we would go through some places with mud, and I mean, I'm telling you what, there was um, um, there was a lot of. Uh, so I just got a new paper towel here as we're talking, stuff. And he never looked dirty. The rest of us be covered in mud, splashed, and everything, and he never got any dirt on him. And we never understood that. Just you know, and Cinnamon and I were talking, and did you know? She she said that she could actually paint in an evening gown and not get paint on her. I ask you guys, I can't do that. I'm painting in a t-shirt and I'm covered in paint when the session's over. I don't know how she does it. You know, I have never been a person, huh, John, John. that would not be me, would it? No. That could do that, right? Well, I'm sorry, I digress. I just think about that, and it's so, it's so fascinating to me that uh, I think I have to put some more colors out here again to finish the flowers. I'm about, about finished with this, but just a, this is a fun. One piece. I like Adirondack chairs. I've, I've never owned an Adirondack chair. I always like how they look. There's just something about them that's quite marvelous, isn't there? And um, uh, when we were this last summer, we were up in um, in uh, Canada, uh, you know, on an excursion from one of our cruises, and there was this, I've got a picture of it, there's these beautiful red Adirondack chairs and they were out on this meadow, I mean in this kind of gar formal garden for this place where we'd stopped for lunch. And uh, I sat down in one and let me tell you something, I couldn't get out, I couldn't get out of it. So the days of um, Thinking, I want an Adirondack chair in case anybody thinks, oh, I'll send, let's send Ginger an Adirondack chair. She'll love it. Uh, 
Well, you know, 30 years ago, maybe so. <laughs> Not so much now, huh, John? They pretty much uh, suck you down into their little caves there. Yeah, you get sucked in. It's like one of my friends, good friends, um, American Express had a Corvette or something they were giving away as a drawing, but you had to. So he, he wanted to win that Corvette. It's a true story. He wanted to win the Corvette a couple of years ago. And um, uh, they won it. He won it. I guess he put everything, the, every, all the bills, all the house bills, everything went on his American Express card. But he, um, he won the Corvette. And um, they were both so old that they couldn't get in and out of it, you know? And he ended up actually making money on it, kept it for a couple of years, never drove it, because neither one of his wife could get in and out of it. And then ended up um, uh, selling it and tra trading money and actually made, he made quite a profit on it. He's quite a wheeler dealer, but I think sometimes by the time you have the money to buy something, then, you know, maybe that ship has sailed kind of thing, right? Uh, anyway, I think that's kind of, move this off, I need my pinks here. What are you looking for, Queenie? My luminous rose, but I think I can, you got it? Yeah, get it. It's in the luminous section. So I'm going to just put it on the stick because you I don't want to dump much. a whole bunch out. Just a little dab will do you. Yeah. So, but there was a time in my life, I just, Cinnamon's dad, I mean, I can't believe it. He's, he's, um, let's see. Let's move this over here. He's still, uh, you know, doing mountain biking up and down, you know, really rough terrain. Still doing that. And his, I th I'm amazed his knees are still so good at 80. He hasn't had a knee implant or anything. And he can still do it. Which is pretty impressive in itself, yes and yes. Indeed. It's just, getting my little flowers in here. So we started this story off by talking about my log and being so mad because he let it break, but we, it looked beautiful in the garden, even broken, it was just in two pieces. And it was rotten, so it was going to break eventually anyway. Um, I think the reason, in retrospect, that I was so angry with Colby was because um, I always got behind his project, and I just didn't feel the reciprocation of this. If he didn't think it was a good idea, then you, you didn't get his full genius, because he really was a genius. Still is, as far as I know. But again... Um, uh, you never know about people and how life turns out for all of us. The When we were living in uh, California, that people built houses on a house pad, house pads. They came in and just carved like, almost like stairs, but large enough to put a house on. And there was a large hill on the other side of Lone Jack that um, uh, uh, people had uh, built a big subdivision on and. At one point, it rained, and the uh, a whole bunch of that uh, of those pads just slid, slid down, and they didn't 
they didn't, they just kind of put the pads back and moved on. And then years later, the, 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 the houses that were built, in, built on those ones that were, um, you know, had been done like that, they just, um, they were gone. And we had the pictures. This was so interesting. Colby had taken pictures of the, um, of those uh, houses like that, taken pictures, but um, I don't think that we weren't able to give them to anybody that, that might have, where it might have made a difference. So now what I'm doing is as I'm telling you just these odd little tales of stuff I'm putting in my lighter colors. flowers here. Any questions on any of this, John? Uh, no. Or we just, might go, we've got a couple of new visitors. We might tell everybody what this episode is and why they're not seeing you and what's, and you're just blabbing. Yeah, so this is, these are not, this is story time. These are not tutorials. If you're new to the channel, we have step-by-step -step tutorials on how to paint things. Um, we've been doing that for a number of years, and we have those on Monday nights. Uh, Ginger Cook Live on Monday nights, you will um, be able to see those, okay? And uh, this is, uh, these are paintings that have been, uh, been pre-sold. Part of promotion we did with our art school. We have an online art school paintingwithginger.com, where we teach a very advanced to be beginner, never picked up a paintbrush is where I'd like to find you. You new ones, I'd really like to see you beginners because I'd like to give you a good start. Uh, people say, well, I'm not good enough to be part of the art school. Yes, you are. You, you are the persons that I really would love to see you um, consider um, hanging out with us because, um, ah, the, um, you know, if, it's like learning to play golf. If they can get you before you've um, developed any bad habits, bad habits yep. you're much, you have a better chance of learning to play, yes? That's the whole trick, you know. Could I get you before you've got any, you know, really bad, bad before habits? Before they're fully ingrained. You know, yeah, because you have something called muscle memory and you'll start doing stuff you don't mean to, but you have something called muscle memory and you're much more likely to um, uh, fall back on those things if you're um, uh, if I get you in the beginning, I can tr I can sort of train you and or let you train yourself maybe self-paced um, show you habits to develop that will save hours um, of just sort of, gosh, I wish I'd known that, wish I'd known that, and how, I, I know what she wants me to do, I just can't figure out how to do it now, right? That kind of stuff. So, those are just some some good reasons why you might want to consider um, uh, going to ginger, uh, a painting with ginger.com and looking at all over 700 step-by-step -step videos. And then the other thing we do is we have personal art coaching and where if you're a red or purple member, you can send your artwork in to me um, for help. 
and I'll do little videos and show you how you can improve the paintings that you're doing and what you might want to consider doing. Okay. Well, I'm getting pretty close to being finished here, John, if you want to find us a frame. Maybe you want so, to show. I don't know if I can find a frame. And then maybe what this 8 by 10s so we might, with one of these pretty, maybe that green one would look pretty. What do you think? That's what I was thinking. Is that what you were thinking? I was thinking. I'll have to dry everything, but um, For sure. I don't want to do uh, too much. It's another beautiful one, I'm telling you. People are really getting some nice paintings out of this. Yeah, I, I think that, um, I think people will enjoy them. I hope so. I'm giving you personal art coaching. Yeah? I'm looking it over. Yeah, you see anything I'm missing? Well, I'll still add, add some things. Well, you got the shadows. I thought I'd get you on the shadows. Yeah, they're pretty good, right? Yep. Uh, yeah, you did good. Drat. Yeah, well, that's... I thought uh, I'd find something. Yeah. 8 by 10 green. Got it right here, boss. Yeah, let me just... Um, who, who's the one that claimed this, John? Um, Nanette. Wholefly. She's okay. been with us forever. Awesome. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm excited. And she's excited. Well, this will, you know, this is great. I'm glad you like that. Anyways, like I say, I love adding around like chairs. And... And I love gardens, so I'm not, you know, I, sometimes, you know, and, but I tell you what, if you, Southern California was the place to, um, to have a garden painting, for sure, because you just, you could grow anything, plant a garden and Aspen, and you know you were seasonal, so you couldn't really, you know, you were lucky to get anything. It just by the time I, I had a lilac tree, and by the time I had, um, um, had lilacs. I mean, it was like four, ten, you know six years to get lilacs at that altitude. So this was, for me. So much better. John's just rummaging around as I. Huh? What do you think? Pretty. Yeah. It's a mud yeah. pile. It's my first um, painting. Okay, I'm ready for you when you're ready. I need it I'm, dried though. I'm gonna dry this and just see where my flowers look. I may have to brighten up a couple. I can do that while they're in the frame. We have, like I say, we have tutorials on YouTube and in our academy, and I said the closest one to this would be uh, Rosegate um, on our website, Rosegate, and it's got some flowers and a brick wall and stuff if anybody wants to check that one out, Rosegate. And, Something a little brighter pink up here on this. Just put, brighten up those pink flowers a bit. Of 
Flowers are never just one color. We talk about that all the time. There's always a dark and a light side to a flower. Yes. A little dark spot you got there? Yeah, I probably want to tone that down. Well, some people think it's a turtle. I thought it looked like a shark on my little screen. Yeah, well, it, has a little bit of, a... it has a little bit of a description. Just throwing that out there. Yeah, no, no, it's, it's a... Uh, it is a very it's an dark extra, and light extra right piece there, of, um, extra You're, piece of... Uh, your eye kind of goes to it. Yeah, it does. So we'll just, uh, we'll just, uh, your eye goes first to the lightest light and the darkest dark. Well, that guy's standing right there on the post, so <laughs> kind of go bam. It's kind of a blue gray color here. Just try a different, let's try a cleaner brush than that. Now I'll work on that. We just need a clean brush. I had too many other colors on that brush. Kind of running out of. Let's get my gray going here. gray. Well, all right, let's get rid of this here because I didn't have a clean paper towel there and I just dipped my brush into a whole other color. Go. Well, that happy accident. Okay, so where'd you put the little blue frame? Oh, we're going green. Oh, the green one, huh? Yep. Can I have? Oh, it's not doing this. It's not that. Oh, okay. My bad. Hold on now. I forgot what canvas you were using. Well, it's an eight by ten. Yes, but it's canvas and not the board. I got it set up for a board. Okay. Well, John's setting that up. I'll see if there's any other touches that I want to to finish around here, just for the painting, for the sake of doing the painting. Making sure I have my you always. lights and darks in here. Um, you just lay it on top when you're ready. Okay. I'll do that now. And keep the paint off my frame, please. And slide it just a little bit. There you go. Well, I'm liking that. So that's sort of a little magical piece, isn't it? The garden set. Uh, you know, you wish you had. <coughs> and I hope you guys are enjoying story times. We will be, you know, sometimes you know, the last few days we were talking about uh, selling artwork. And then I told you a little bit about my trip to Chicago and seeing the clothes painting. But um, the man that 
that started IGI International that, um, you know, deceived all those people. Um, he died. He wasn't even 50. Died of a heart attack or whatever. But he never lived to see his court date where he was going to be put in jail for all the for all the crimes that, you know, of cheating. All the misdealings. And I got some of my original paintings back, a few. I never got my, I never got any more money from them. That's um, really wrong in so many ways. But, you know what, I had a good experience and uh, met some great people. And I'm not the least bit sorry I did it, right? So that in itself is a plus, yes and yes. And I'm going to sign this. And um, for those of you who are in our Academy for Fine Art and Acrylic Painting, or PaintingWithGinger.com is what we're now calling it, we will be doing a wonderful landscape. I'll, not this painting, but we will be doing one in the future in the academy, so don't worry that this, while this is not a tutorial, um, don't despair, we will, we will be having, I know people like this, so we will be painting another garden with an Andorondike chair, I promise, okay? Um, And so wish I hope everybody you know if you're new to the channel I hope you'll consider consider subscribing. Like I say, we are doing. I have a lot of paintings to do, so we're doing a lot of story times. And, um, and we have more stories to tell. More stories to tell. And I hope that we all had fun with the story of Elise and the, um, and the shoe shine rag. <laughs> That's, mm. to me, one of the, my favorite stories of all time was her and that. Which one? Elise and the Proctor of the shoe shine rag. I hope everybody's 2004 is what you're hoping it's going to be. We're hoping to have more subscribers to this channel, and we can do that with your help. We appreciate those of you who have contributed to our scholarship fund. Um, we appreciate those who share this on your channel, those of you guys who have commented. You'll notice I have read all your comments, and we've had some new people commenting too, and thank you very much for that. And. Um, The uh, fun thing about painting, on for me, the fun thing is I'm doing, you're seeing all kinds of different painting, right? You see, you, you see that, right? You're seeing all kinds of... Yes, I am. You just... And, you know, have a wonderful day, and thanks for joining us, and share the videos. Thank you. Bye. You the show's over? I think so. I think so. Well, you did a marvelous job. Thank you. Another job well done. Well, everybody, thanks for joining us. Let's put up our little sign. Boing. And we will possibly be here tomorrow. One never knows for sure. <laughs> You never know. We don't have a scheduled time for these. No. It's just a few times a week we're doing them. I still have to go get a pedicure. Yeah, um, me too. And um, uh, All right. Enough wanna, of that. Enough of that. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Bye. everybody. Bye.